Happy New Year, everyone! Welcome to the first episode of Espresso and Electronics Quick Sips of EDA Wisdom for 2025. I'm your host Anika Sunda, and today we're going to talk talk about a very interesting topic, which I think all of us are hearing here and there, is how UCI is transforming the landscape of chip architecture. And joining me today is Anune Bajaj who is a semiconductor technology expert, and he's going to share his insights on how UCI is reshaping the chip architecture. Welcome to the show, Anune. Thank you, Anika. I'm excited to be here and discuss the important topic with the audience. Thank you, Anune. So let's dive in right away. And could you explain the importance of UCI protocol in the chiplet framework or in the chiplet domain? I think before we talk about UCI, let's talk about what are chiplets. Uh, and why chiplets have become important. Um, if, if you see traditionally, uh, the chips have been designed with a large monolithic design. Uh, but as you can see, there are a lot of innovations happening, AI coming in, a lot of automotive innovation happening. Uh, the need for compute has actually increased a, a lot. Uh, and what has actually happened is you have reached the maximum reticle limit. The meaning is that you can only put as much in, in a single die. So now what do you do? You either increase the die size and you can increase it up to infinity or you break it down to you know multiple slices of die. But increasing the die size to infinite levels is, is, is not possible. Right. It's, it's impractical, impractical for sure. Uh, so, so then comes the concept of breaking the functionality into multiple smaller chunks and then connecting them together. So that's where uh, you know the term chiplets or or dies uh, come into place. You basically divide the complete functionality into multiple uh, functions, and those functions actually reside in different uh, chiplets. And those chiplets are actually integrated together. And the integration is actually done through various protocols, and that's where UCI comes into play, which is universal chiplet interconnect. And, and that's the push of the UCA consortium as well uh, for the last uh, three plus years to come up with a standardized uh, chiplet interconnect, which can actually uh, connect all possible uh, dies, regardless of their size, uh, their nodes, functionality. So that's the direction uh, that we see. Here. Interesting. So can you elaborate a little bit more on what pivotal role is UCI playing in this evolution, right? I mean. It's for right. sure an evolution, right? Right, right. So yeah, so I think uh, UCI is definitely uh, important, and there have been a uh, lot of uh, interconnect technologies in the past, but all of those technologies have been uh, proprietary to to different design companies. Uh, so this concept of chiplets is actually not very new. Uh, many design companies have been doing that, uh, but UCI and coming from a consortium. It's actually a push to make this thing standard so that different players, different vendors, uh, different uh, key suppliers can actually uh, work together in a democratized manner and you can come up with interesting solutions, innovative solutions. So that's the, uh, I would say, USP of UCI that it's open. Uh, all members are there, many key companies are there, Cadence is there uh, as a key uh, member and a driving force so in, in that way, yes, UCI is uh, very, very important and it has a long way to go. Interesting. So is there any implication that you see that it brings along for the chip architecture? Yes, uh, there is an implication for sure because um, if, if you are using uh, UCI as a chiplet interconnect, uh, you need to follow certain rules uh, which are defined by the UCI uh, consortium. In general, there is a, a clear demarcation, like your your chip functionality. Let's take an example. If you have a CPU, mm -hmm. uh, CPU chip, which has been broken into multiple chiplets and connected back. So the functionality of uh, the key functionality, it is not affected at all. Uh, but then the control, the, the basic flow has to be compliant with the UCI rules. So UCI has a definite stack. And if I go just a bit uh, deeper into technical side, uh, it's a layered protocol. You have a protocol layer at the top, followed by an adapter, also called die-to-die -die adapter. And then you have a physical layer. And from the physical layer, you have the connections to the other uh, 
die partner so protocol layer is interesting because protocol layer is something which is uh, sometimes fused and sometimes merged with the key functionalities of uh, the uh, the the function in question for example you have a cpu uh, design mm -hmm. and you have certain coherency protocols running on top of that so probably the coherency rules are fused with the protocol layer of the uci design and then the rest is all uci stack so so different uh, adoption we have seen so so coming back to your question yes there are implications but there is also a lot of freedom uh, with respect to uci usage i'm sure you agree with me that uci brings a lot of competition in the tech industry right so yeah. Do you have something to talk about it? What are your thoughts? Yes, it's definitely a competition, but I would say it's a healthy competition <laughs> um, because, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a standard and it has actually given a level playing field mm -hmm. for a for lot of uh, uh, suppliers. Uh, not, not everyone, uh, if, if I just talk about the nodes, right? So we are going down to two nanometer and even further down. Uh, so not every uh, every vendor could actually produce chips because as you go down in in the nanometer range, uh, the production becomes expensive. So when UCI comes into play, it it gives you the flexibility that you can even connect chiplets at larger nanometers, mm -hmm. and and it's an it's an open field now. Now even a small vendor, a small design company could could actually produce chips which are compliant with uh, UCI and it can integrate with, with some other chip. So in that way, it's a competition, but also a good, um, I'll say again, level playing field uh, to, you know, to, to collaborate in a democratized manner. Great insights, Anne. So, I mean, you work with customers day in, day out, right? So mm -hmm. what is the typical, you know, connection that you see or, you know, is there any, uh, you know, something that you want to tell to the listeners, you've been using Cadence tools, right? right? What is it that you use? How is it that you use in a typical setup, right? Right, right. No, I think uh, uh, it's it's very important uh, to choose the right partner, right Absolutely. vendor, um, especially when it comes to UCI. It's an emerging standard. Uh, we just had UCI 2.0 uh, launched uh, like a few months back. Uh, again, this is a very, very fluid uh, technology things are evolving uh, many sectors many uh, sections like ai automotive uh, networking people are trying different things uh, to become more productive uh, so it's important to choose the right vendor and right partner right from the start um, if i just uh, talk about uh, the cadence tools uh, so there are tools you know varying from design from verification and also related to fabrication. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm coming from the verification background, so I'll just touch base on that. Uh, verification of uh, designs become uh, a very, very important thing because you are not just verifying a chiplet, you are actually verifying a system of chiplets. Exactly. You might have uh, eight chiplets or 16 chiplets working together. So verification becomes essential. And for that, you need to have the right strategy. Like you could use uh, Exilium, some of the uh, innovative technologies uh, coming in Exilium to to speed up your uh, simulation, especially for multi-chip. Uh, then there are VIPs uh, for multi-chip. Then if you if you speed up to acceleration, a lot of uh, acceleration products are there. Uh, and and finally, you have uh, certain products related to uh, formal verification. So you have to choose the right strategy. You should know where your verification, uh, uh, what's your verification goal uh, and which tool is right for you. Uh, and not just the tool, it actually depends the experts you are connected with. So you have to be in touch with the experts who can guide you and speed up your verification cycle. And I believe the same goes with the design as well. Uh, you need to have the right design partners uh, who can guide you and accelerate your design cycle. So I think that would be my uh, uh, final input that uh, uh, choosing the right partner is essential. Absolutely. Yes. And I think you should always trust the leader, right? Because absolutely, it, yeah, they can help you go a long way. So, uh, so ending on that note, 
I mean, I know performance compliance is like a big whale, right? That we cannot cover in this uh, podcast. Mm. But do you have any thoughts before we end the podcast? Yeah, I think performance and uh, compliance are very critical. Uh, uh, and there's a strong push from UCI uh, consortium as well. Uh, there's, um, you know, it's a very dedicated chapter on the compliance for people who read the specification. So compliance will become important. And and we have had, like from Cadence's point of view, we have had uh, users asking for compliance suites. Uh, and we do have uh, things for them. Okay. Uh, and finally, yes, uh, it's an evolving space. Uh, and we have to keep evolving ourselves as well, like Cadence as well. Uh, we keep a very, uh, uh, you know, we keep our, our eye on the changes. Mm -hmm. We are part of the consortium. So any change that happens, any 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 input uh, which a consortium would seek from us uh, is actually given from us. Yeah. Thank you, Anunay. It's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you listeners for tuning in.